Today we've got the writers of Thor and X-Men First Class, Ashley Miller and Zach Stent, right here on BFD. History doesn't always have to be stale and boring, and it doesn't always have to come from textbooks. Here to talk about the fascinating intersection between entertainment and history are our good friends Zach Stentz and Ashley Miller. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Oh, it's Thank so our pleasure. Okay, so you guys have written a few, you know, smaller films in Little your day. Little art house things? Well, yeah, um, hang on, wait, let me... Um, X-Men, First Class, and Thor. I think I've heard of these. Right. Before. Thor was the large superior film. Right. Okay. Yes. So first off, let's talk a little bit about X Men First Class, which was incredible, by the way. Well, thank Congratulations. You. Thank you very much. And one of the coolest things about this film is that it was set during, set during the Cuban Missile Crisis. What inspired you guys to set it during that time period? Actually, that was uh, that was Brian Singer, the uh, the producer, really? the producer's idea. He came into Fox with the idea and this was after uh, this was after the JJ Abrams Star Trek came out in 2009 right um, and he came in with a fantastic idea for an X-Men prequel that would be a little bit like that would be a little bit like how you first saw Kirk and Spock meet each other in uh, sure. in the Star Trek it would be about how Charles and Charles and Eric met each, met each other and he wanted to work in real history so he thought that the big historical incident should be the Cuban Missile Crisis, and and once we came on board, it kind of uh, you know it kind of went from there, and and all of the implications of uh, what that would mean to have mutants running around in the background of real history. So, are you guys history buffs? Oh yeah, we're gigantic history nerds. Yeah, we can bore you all day long. It, exactly. <laughs> it's it's we're both huge fans of uh, of science fiction and fantasy, and. Uh, one of the kind of dirty little secrets about writing science fiction and fantasy is that you go to history all the time for your inspirations because real history is so fascinating and so unlikely in its own way that uh, that you can transpose it into a fantasy setting or a uh, or a science fiction setting and and it'll seem completely fresh and new. Sure. So how difficult is it to combine fantasy and history? Because like clearly we didn't have mutants running around in that we know of. Night, that we know we? of, right. exactly. Um, so yeah, how difficult is blending the two and finding that perfect balance? Well, first you have to remember that you're not writing a movie about powers, History. Right? right? Well, you're not you're not writing it about like the guys who can you know move stuff with their mind or read sure. minds. You're writing it about um, these young men with very specific problems and very specific issues who are products of their time. Um, for Eric. Uh, who eventually becomes Magneto, mm -hmm. uh, even his origin is tied up in history, going right. back to the Holocaust. Sure. And he has an emotional relationship with that. So one of the things that you try to do is say, if we're just writing a straight-up historical drama, who are these guys? How do they behave? You know, what are their attitudes like? And what happens when they come into conflict? And, and what's informing that? Because if you make it about the powers, you're not really making it about anything. You're just making it about stuff blowing up, and you can do that anytime right yeah and if you if you think about it JFK had a superpower he could pick up the phone and, and order call Marilyn Monroe well, yeah that was one <laughs> but he could also order a thousand nuclear weapons to be launched with a you know by by picking up a phone what what greater power what greater power could there be than that so Charlie Marilyn Monroe yeah probably <laughs> so Brian Singer comes to you guys and then he's like Cuban Missile Crisis where <laughs> where do you start well, just to clarify, there was a there was a draft of the script before we came in. Okay. Um, but in a lot of ways, we kind of went back to. We like to think we went back to Brian's original story and Brian's original concept. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you construct a, as Ash said, you construct a drama first, but then you also do research about you do research about the history yeah. to figure out. You know, you're not a slave to it. At, as in, oh well, if this if this particular ship wasn't in this particular location, we can't do this. Sure. You don't worry about it at that level of detail. Although we did actually end up, uh, we, we did end up doing a tremendous amount of research as to where the uh, Soviet and American fleets were in October 1962. But <laughs> the, so there are so many of those little details that apparently no one is paying attention to. But 
Right. You know. Although, yeah. you know, some of that stuff, you, you do that research on a, on a just-in-time basis. When you get down into the weeds of, you know, locations and names and all of those things, the, sure. you know, the first task really is to say, all right, if this is our setup and, and this is our story, what's going on? What are we smack dab in the middle of and what does that build up feel like? In fact, one of the, I, I think one of the more subtle and difficult challenges of structuring the film was how do you build to the Cuban Missile Crisis and make that feel like history is marching along, make it feel like we're intersecting with that process, um, but we're not introducing elements that are clearly ahistorical um, right. so that it, you're looking at it like it's a James Bond film and it's you're up against Dr. No or you're up against Blofeld and it's what's his plan. So you have to think of the build up to the Cuban Missile Crisis in that way and, and think of it dramatically. And that's, that's really task one is that thought experiment. Yeah, so we take the actual incidents that led up to the Cuban Missile Crisis and imagine if there was a tremendously powerful mutant named Sebastian Shaw who was behind the scenes manipulating things to try and bring about a nuclear war, how would he fit in each of those things? And how, where would he get a summary? Um, where indeed? Where? Um, and <laughs> what would he be? What would he be doing to try and uh, to to try and uh, you know, ratchet things up until there was an actual nuclear exchange? So. Sure. You know, you look at you. You can use real history as the kind of framework to start hanging your your fictional incidents on. Do you feel like history can be so fantastical at times that it was fairly simple to insert mutants with superpowers into the story? Tremendously. I mean, I mean, there are. If you read the actual history of the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's terrifying. Sure. It's. The most miraculous thing about it is that it didn't end up in, in a nuclear war. Right. There, there are so many things that if one thing would have gone differently, there, you know, for example, there was an actual submarine trailing the Soviet cargo ships as they came there. It was a Russian submarine rather than a mutant submarine. And at one point, the, uh, the American fleet started depth charging it. And the captain of the submarine wanted to launch a nuclear torpedo at the American fleet. To, uh, and there was no radio communication back with Moscow, and it was sure. only because the second in command of the submarine refused to authorize the, uh, the torpedo launch that there wasn't a nuclear exchange you know, that, that neither uh, Khrushchev or Kennedy authorized, but that would have probably escalated, escalated, escalated. From right. There. So there, there, you know, the real history is so, it is fantastical in, in many ways. So it's, it, it, in many ways, it isn't a stretch thinking that there might have been some good mutants there making sure that we didn't tip over into, uh, into nuclear war. Right. But it's also interesting to me, the whole um, submarine incident. And I remember, you know, Zach and I talking about that as, as we were structuring the third act. And um, the thing that's interesting about the story of the captain and his XO and not launching that torpedo is if you think about it, there's a, there's a really fascinating thematic parallel with Eric and Charles on that beach. You know, the, the decisions really come down to, in that movie and in history, are we going to destroy the world today? And why <laughs> and for who? And, and that's huge. And in some ways, simply having those two guys in that incredibly heightened situation makes it easier to deal with, I think, and in yeah. some ways makes it more relatable because you can bring it back to their relationship in a very specific uh, personal way. But it's just the the connections between the history, I think, and the, and the drama can just be fascinating the more you unpack them. Do you feel like this story would have been as impactful if you hadn't rooted it in an actual historical event? I think the Pueblo incident would have been slightly less dramatic, but um, or or you know not not doing it as a historical as a histor you know if we would have just made it up from whole cloth, I don't think it would have n had nearly as much impact as it as it did. I I think that I think that people really enjoy secret history, uh, secret history, and also as Ash just uh, just was pointing out, the resonances in real history make drama you know really make drama sing sing more. Mm -hmm. You know the, that that. It was it was a big controversial deal when they decided to make you know back, when was that back in the, was that Chris Claremont who first made uh, Magneto a Holocaust survivor? Uh, um, that sounds right. Yeah, uh, I mean that wasn't always part of Magneto's backstory. That was right. something that was added to kind of add more kind of layering and shading. 
And when that first, you know, when the first X Men movie came up, and you and uh, they st and a lot of the audience was going, especially critics saying, "Oh my God, they're starting a superhero movie in Auschwitz. What are they yeah. doing? How, how dare they? A... You know, some, some people were even saying, "How dare they?" Um, but you know, real real history and combining it with something like uh, a superhero movie can can honestly make people make people think more deeply about sure. about history. So you guys also wrote on Fringe, mm -hmm. which isn't rooted in history, but does involve a lot of science and pseudoscience. How is it writing for that? And how is it different than writing for historically? In a, in a lot of ways, it was the same. Because when you sit down to write, I think when you sit down to write a genre piece, and you're being intellectually honest about it. The things that you touch on, whether it's the Cuban Missile Crisis or it's brain science, um, you want to be able to say meaningful things about it, number one. Number two, you never know what fun little bit of information is going to pop up that changes the direction of your story or something that gives mm. you an insight into um, how people can be. Uh, so you really do have to sit down and become smart enough to actually write the story that you're going to write in a way that makes it feel like it's grounded in something. And it's, it's a lot of the same process at work, which is, you know, we do not approach fantasy and science fiction as anything can happen. We approach it much more, how would the world be differently, or be different if this one thing existed, you know, if a guy with a magic, if a guy from a magic hammer landed in the middle of New Mexico. And, <laughs> you know, trying to keep every, trying to keep everyone's reactions to something fantastical as grounded as you can yeah. is, uh, you know, is a key part of making, making these things work dramatically. So Ashley, you often talk about how you're such a fan of the Marvel Universe as opposed to the DC Universe because it's often rooted in history. What's your reasoning behind that? Well, you know, I, I love Marvel and I love DC. I think the thing that makes Marvel different and special is that it really, those heroes attempt to live in a world that we recognize. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it makes it easier to understand them as people because they talk about events in the same way that, that we do. Even things as, it's not really simple, but even things as obvious as 9-11, it happens in the Marvel Universe. It has an impact, there are consequences. Um, you know, we can talk about those things directly through the comics and, and we can relate to who those people are. Um, and so when you sit down and you write something like X-Men First Class and you're talking about the history of it, you don't have to worry about, well, you know, where was Superman? I mean, the, the fact is that this is all taking place in a, in a world that we recognize. You know, and one of the things that we've learned over and over again is that you know these stories about these seemingly strange things that you think my god I, how did i not hear about that how did i not know yeah. about that well you know what sometimes you just don't um that people and events thread themselves through history in interesting ways and what's great about marvel often is that you feel like they're threading that needle in a way that you believe and that makes sense History can be found everywhere, and even in places you least expect it. Say, like, a huge blockbuster movie about superheroes. So I have a challenge for you. Be like a superhero and take action by clicking the links in the description below. For BFD, I'm Rocheray, and don't forget to subscribe.